Welcome to this deep dive. We're tackling something pretty foundational today, the opening chapter of Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens. That's right. A book that's had a huge impact. Absolutely. And you, our listeners, sent this one in. So our mission here is to really unpack this first chapter. We'll hit the key ideas, the timeline he sets up, the arguments, um, the data points, those great examples he uses. Basically everything. We want to cover the evolutionary side, the social shifts, and Harari's core arguments about where we came from. It's a huge scope, starting way back. Oh, yeah. Big Bang, formation of Earth, life itself. Then zooming into Homo sapiens, he sets the stage for the big three revolutions later. Cognitive, agricultural, scientific. You need that long view. Definitely. And right off the bat, he hits us with something, well, humbling. You mean the animal of no significance idea? Exactly. For millions of years, humans yeah. were just there. Yeah. No more impact than jellyfish or, you know, fireflies. Puts things in perspective. It really does. It challenges that idea that we were always destined to be dominant. He uses biological classification to make the point. Right. The species, genus, family stuff. Yeah. Species can have fertile kids together. Genus is like lions, tigers, different species, same genus, panthera. Families, brat, or like all cats or all dogs. Okay. Got it. And our place. We're in the great ape family. And our closest living relatives, chimpanzees. Only six million years back, common ancestor. That's not that long, evolutionarily speaking. It's closer than many people realize or maybe want to admit, as Harari suggests. And then he drops the skeletons in the closet. Ah, yes. The, uh, the disturbing secret. That Homo sapiens wasn't alone. That there were other human species. Exactly. Human meaning anything in the genus Homo. Sapiens is just us, specifically. But the planet used to have several types walking around. It's wild to think about. She traces it back, what, 2.5 million years ago? East Africa, Australopithecus? Then some groups leave Africa, maybe 2 million years ago, spread out into Europe, Asia. And they adapt, right? Different places, different pressures, leads to different species. Precisely. You get the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis, in Europe and West Asia. Stockier, built for the cold. And Homo erectus in East Asia, the upright man. They lasted a long time. Almost two million years. Mm -hmm. Phenomenally successful. Then you had others, like Homo soloensis on Java, tropical adaptation. And the hobbits. Homo floresiensis on Flores Island. Tiny little humans. Island dwarfism, yeah. Limited resources, fewer predators, they shrink. <laughs> but they still made tools. Hunted dwarf elephants, even. Incredible. Plus the Denisovans found in Siberia, mainly from, like, a finger bone and DNA. And other finds in East Africa, too. Homo rudolfensis ergaster. The family tree was bushy. So for almost 2 million years, up until maybe 10,000 years ago, there were multiple kinds of humans sharing the planet. That was the norm. Our current situation, being the only ones left, mm. that's the weird part. And maybe, as he hints, a bit incriminating. Potentially. <laughs> it raises questions, which leads nicely into the brain discussion. Ah, the cost of thinking, the big brain. That's the hallmark of Homo, right? Pretty much. He gives the numbers. A 60-kilogram mammal might have a 200cc brain. Early humans, around 600 cc. Yeah. Us, sapiens, 1,200 to 1,400 cc. Neanderthals, maybe even bigger? Slightly larger on average, yeah. But Harari immediately asks, okay, bigger is always better, right? Well, yeah. if it was, cats would be doing calculus. Exactly. So why us? Why did Homo go down this path of massive brain development? Because it wasn't cheap. It costs a lot of energy. A huge amount. Our brain is, what, 2 3% of body weight? but uses 25% of our resting energy. Wow. Compared to other apes? They use about 8%. So that extra energy had to come from somewhere. More time finding food. And likely less energy from muscles. Mm. Muscle atrophy. Like a government diverting funds from, say, defense to education, he says. And the payoff wasn't immediate. For two million years, big brains didn't suddenly mean advanced tech. Nope. Just slightly better stone tools for a very, very long time. Cars and guns are recent developments. So the initial evolutionary driver for such huge brains, it's still a bit of a mystery. Okay, besides brains, there's walking upright. Bipedalism, another defining human trait. Huge advantages, obviously. You can see further, scan for danger or food. And crucially, your hands are free. Which lets you do things, carry stuff, make tools. Exactly. Over time, that leads to developing fine motor skills, dexterity. Tool use starts way back. 2.5 million years ago. That's kind of the marker for identifying ancient humans. But like the brain, it had downsides. Oh, yeah. Our skeletons weren't really designed for it originally, not while supporting a big head. Leads to back aches, stiff necks, 
That, Sound familiar? Yes, very familiar, and for women, even tougher. A major challenge. Walking upright favors narrower hips, but brains were getting bigger, meaning bigger baby heads. That's a conflict. Narrower birth canal, bigger head, makes childbirth much more dangerous. Precisely. So natural selection favored babies being born earlier, when their heads were smaller and brains less developed. Which means human babies are super helpless for a long time. Incredibly dependent. Compared to, say, a foal that can walk almost immediately, this has massive social consequences. You need help raising them, a whole tribe or community. Strong social bonds become essential, and being born so unfinished, so malleable, like molten glass, as Harari puts it. it means we can be shaped more by learning and culture. Exactly. Huge capacity for learning, socialization. It allows for all the diverse societies we see later. It's a direct consequence of walking upright and having big brains. Okay, so big brains, free hands, tools, social structures. You'd think humans shot straight to the top, right? Logically, yes. <laughs> but Harari says, hold on. The food chain shuffle section makes it clear that for about 2 million years, none of that made us dominant. We were still weak, marginal. Absolutely. Scared of predators, mostly gathering plants, eating insects, maybe scavenging kills left by real predators, rarely hunting big stuff ourselves. He has that theory about marrow, right? Like yeah. our niche was cracking open bones after the lions and hyenas were done. Yeah, comparing us to woodpeckers finding a specialized food source others couldn't easily get. It's a very different picture. Humans sneaking in last for the leftovers. Definitely puts us in the middle of the food chain for most of our history. Yeah. We hunted, but we were also heavily hunted. When did that change? When did we jump to the top? Relatively recently, maybe starting around 400,000 years ago with more regular big game hunting, but really solidifying only with sapiens maybe 100,000 years ago. That's incredibly fast in evolutionary terms. Super fast. And that's Hurry's point. The ecosystem, the ecosystem didn't have time to adjust. No checks and balances evolved. And we didn't have time to adjust. Psychologically, socially, yeah. He uses that provocative analogy, sapiens as a banana republic dictator. Insecure, jumpy, maybe cruel because we climb the ladder so fast from being underdogs. That's the idea. He links it to why humans have caused so much ecological damage and historical calamities. We're not comfortable or adjusted top predators. Wow. Okay, so what helped us make that jump? Fire must be part of it. A huge part. A race of cooks. The control of fire. That was a game changer. People knew about fire earlier, but using it daily? Yeah. When did that start? Probably around 300,000 years ago. Homo erectus, Neanderthals, our sapiens ancestors, using it for warmth, light, keeping predators away. And even changing the landscape. Yeah. Burning areas. Yeah. Creating grasslands to attract game, maybe harvesting stuff after a fire. But the biggest thing was cooking. Making things edible that weren't before. Totally. Things like wheat, rice, potatoes, staples for us now are indigestible raw. Cooking unlocks them. Plus, it kills germs, parasites. It makes food safer, easier to chew, easier to digest. Right. He mentions chimps spend like five hours a day just chewing. Mm -hmm. Humans with cooked food, maybe one hour. That saves a lot of time and energy. A ton of energy. And he connects this to our biology. Cooking allows for shorter intestines, which take less energy. Freeing up energy for... The big, energy-hungry brain. It's a plausible link for why Neanderthal and sapiens' brains could get so big. So fire wasn't just a tool. It reshaped our diet, our bodies, our brains. And created the first real gap between humans and other animals. It gave us power beyond our muscles. An eagle uses thermals, but it can't start a thermal. Humans could start and control fire, use it for countless things, right. unlimited potential, basically. Incredible. But even with fire, 150,000 years ago, humans were still... Pretty marginal, yeah. Maybe a million total, scattered around. Sapiens existed, but mostly just in a corner of Africa. So they looked pretty much like us by then. Physically, yes. Mm -hmm. Similar skulls, smaller jaws, probably due to cooked food. Big brains. Okay, then comes the big move. Around 70,000 years ago. Sapiens start spreading out of East Africa into Arabia, and then, boom, across Eurasia pretty quickly. And Eurasia wasn't empty. Not at all. Neanderthals, Denisovans, maybe others were already there. Which brings us to our brother's keepers. What happened when sapiens met them? The big question. And two main theories, right? Interbreeding or replacement? Yep. Interbreeding theory. Sapiens met the locals. They uh, mingled, had kids. So modern people are mixed, like sapiens plus Neanderthal DNA in Europeans, sapiens plus Erectus in East Asians, maybe. Or replacement theory. Sapiens showed up and the others just disappeared. Maybe sapiens outcompeted them. Maybe they couldn't interbreed. Maybe worse. Maybe violence, yeah. 
Aww. So replacement says we're all pure sapiens from that African wave. No mixing. It's a heavy debate. Lots of political baggage attached, historically. Definitely. For a long time, replacement was favored. Partly seemed to fit the archaeology, partly maybe political correctness, wanting to avoid ideas of fundamental differences. But then genetics changed the game. 2010, the Neanderthal genome. Huge breakthrough found that people with European or Middle Eastern roots have like 1-4% to Neanderthal DNA. So interbreeding did happen. It seems so. And then they mapped Denisovan DNA, found up to 6% in modern Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians. So mixing occurred. But not a total merger, right? The percentages are small. Suggests it wasn't super common, or maybe the hybrids weren't always fertile or successful long term. Harari uses the horse donkey analogy versus dog breeds. Right. Horses and donkeys can breed but get a sterile mule different dog breeds. No problem making fertile puppies. Sapiens, Neanderthals, Denisovans around 50,000 years ago might have been like the horse and donkey right on that borderline of being separate species. Still mind-bending to think about interspecies kids back then. It's a wild thought. But if they didn't just merge, why did the others vanish completely? Competition. Sapiens were just better at getting resources. That's one possibility. Slowly pushed out, populations dwindled. Or the darker version, direct conflict genocide. Harari floats that too. If sapiens saw them as different, other, well, human history isn't exactly full of tolerance for the other, even within our own species. Yeah. Could our ancestors have deliberately wiped them out? It's uncomfortable to consider. He asks those what if questions too. What if Neanderthals survived? How different would our world be? Religions, politics, societies. Would we see them as fully human? Would our definition of human be broader? Or would their presence have just led to even more conflict? Maybe our ancestors got rid of them because they were too similar yet too different. It makes you think about why we perceive ourselves as so unique now. The fact is, the timeline is pretty clear. Soloens has gone by 50k years ago, Denisovans son after, Neanderthals around 30k, Floresiensis maybe 12k, then just us? Homo sapiens? The last human species standing. Which brings us back to the question he ends the chapter with. What was sapiens secret? How did we do it? How did we conquer the world and leave everyone else behind? And the answer he hints at for the next chapter is... Our unique language. That's the likely key. Okay, I think we've really covered the ground for this first chapter. From the vast time scale and our initial insignificance. Through the different human species, the costs and benefits of brains and bipedalism, our weird place in the food chain. The massive impact of fire, and then that whole complex, slightly mysterious story of encountering and replacing our human relatives. We hit the evolutionary points, the early social stuff, Harari's main arguments, the data, the examples. Mm -hmm. It's all in there. He really sets up a provocative starting point. Definitely challenges a lot of assumptions about human history right from page one. Makes you rethink our whole trajectory. And the implications, thinking about how we got here, our relationship with other species, even other humans, it resonates right up to today. So the final thought to leave everyone with, building on Harari, considering how quickly sapiens rose and our likely role in the fate of other humans, what does that early story suggest about our capacity, our nature, both creative and destructive, as we face the future? That's a heavy question hanging in the air. Something to chew on. Thanks for joining us for this deep dive.